Welcome back to another Naval News video. Today we're talking about a very important development that just happened over in the Barrett Sea over the weekend. Russia has successfully tested its new hypersonic weapon called the Zarkon missile. And this thing is a beast. Now, my sources for today are going to be the Rand Corporation, which is a nonprofit think tank that does a lot of really good work. And they have some really good graphics and, uh, you know, stories of how these weapons work and how capable they are. So a big salute to the Rand Corporation. They do great things. Uh, the Russian Ministry of Defense, you know, I've just used their public release. They uh, released a video of, of this of this test over the weekend. So we're going to be seeing that. And NASA. NASA has been doing hypersonics and hypersonic testing since the mid 1950s. So they have a lot of cool uh, information and graphics on what we're talking about today. So what is the Zarkon missile? The Zarkon missile is a Mach 9 high altitude anti-ship cruise missile. So Mach 9 means it goes nine times the speed of sound, which is incredibly fast. You know, several times the speed of a bullet to give you some idea of this. It's, it's just super fast. Uh, it, it goes at an altitude of about 120 to 130,000 feet. Up there, the atmosphere is very thin and that's where it needs to be to uh, maintain the scramjet, which we'll explain to you, uh, to, to, to maintain the speed, to maintain that scramjet running. Okay, but the big thing is this thing is maneuverable. In other words, it doesn't go in a straight line and it's not ballistic. Therefore, it's very difficult to calculate an intercept point with a missile that can change its course. There's also a big shock is that the test went twice as far as we thought the Zarkon missile could go. We thought the maximum range was 500 kilometers. Well, that's very wrong. They tested this one successfully at a 1,000 kilometer target and hit it. Uh, that's about 621 miles. So the way this works is that it has a solid rocket booster phase that pushes it up, uh, gets it up to speed. It's called the acceleration phase, uh, gets it near the altitude of 120, 130,000 feet. Booster falls away. Scramjet ignites. There's some fuel added to it, but ignites. And then that propels it at Mach 9 to the target for about six minutes. Now, on the nose of this thing, there is an active and passive radar receiver. So it can actively look for targets, find a target and hit it, or it can just passively home in on the source of a radar emission. So Zarkon flight characteristics. As we saw in the video, it does have a gas generator soft launch pushing it out with the booster motor already igniting, but not at full power. Then some maneuver thrusters uh, take over after it reaches a predetermined altitude above the ship to aim the missile in the direction that it wants to go. Once that happens, the nose holding those little maneuver thruster uh, comes off and then the booster motor fully ignites, pushing this uh, weapon, accelerating it up over 100,000 feet in altitude and getting it up to speed before the booster motor falls away. And then the marching stage begins, and that's with the scramjet sustaining it at high altitude and high speed. So what is a scramjet? A scramjet is a supersonic combustion ramjet. They just push those words together into scramjet. The cool thing about this is you don't need a compressor because it self-compresses using its own shock waves in the engine. And it runs between Mach 5 and Mach 15. It does require fuel to sustain this. So there is still fuel on board, pushing it into the uh, engine there and maintaining its speed. All right, so real quick, the Zarkon advantages are the incredible speed that it has, going very fast, very high, and it's maneuverable. So as the ships that are presumably the targets are looking for this, uh, this missile, they can see the missile, obviously. Uh, they can calculate an intercept point, but that intercept point may not be accurate by the time uh, any defensive missile gets to it because this thing can turn. Uh, another advantage is the range, a thousand kilometers, much longer than we thought. Very, very long range weapon and it's anti-ship. Uh, while we do believe it has a 400 uh, kilogram warhead, uh, it doesn't really need one because it has so much kinetic energy at these speeds that whenever the missile body hits a target, it's going to rip that target and the missile, of course, itself apart. But in addition to that energy, it does have, we think, a 400 kilogram high explosive warhead. 
And the flight time is very short. Six minutes for a cruise missile strike is very short, especially at these long fire ranges. But what that does is it compresses the decision making time anyone has, as well as the ability to shoot this thing down. You know, the, uh, the, the chain of command is going to be shrunk. Uh, you know, it's going to need to be shrunk in order to defend against this. And that leads to its own set of problems, which we'll talk about at the end. So Zarkon limitations, this is not a perfect missile. It has had uh, test failures in the past. One, the scramjet does not function at low altitude. So as it approaches its target, it eventually, because it's an anti-ship cruise missile, has to come down to sea level. As it comes down through the atmosphere, at some point that scramjet will stall out and no longer function. When that happens, without an active propulsion pushing it, the stabilization of the missile has been observed as being unstable and it can tear itself apart. The increased air density may also straight up destroy the engine, right, which would presumably destroy the missile as well. So it could become unstable, spin out of control, fly apart, or it could just explode because of the air density in, in the engine. And Another liability is that radar seeker I told you about. If it has a radar sensor, those sensors can be countered with electronic warfare. And so whether it's an active sensor or passive homing, those can be defeated. And right now it's called a soft kill. A soft kill is the most likely defense we're gonna have against these things because current defense technologies and tactics do not account for maneuvering objects at these speeds. There's really nothing that we have to reliably counter this. So for now, soft kills by defeating the seeker head um, are probably already in place. And I'm sure people smarter than me are working on ways to actively defend against these missiles with hard kills. We have successful demonstrations of shooting down ballistic missiles that travel very fast, but a ballistic missile uh, is easy to calculate the intercept point because it doesn't maneuver. These do, and that changes the game significantly. All right, so final thoughts. Uh, like I said, current air defense systems, ineffective. We need to figure out a new way to defend uh, anything that this thing might be targeting. It's an anti-ship cruise missile, so defending the carrier against this thing, very important. We need to figure that out today because it's operational or they can get it to work. They just demonstrated that it does work. Uh, this is also very destabilizing because now we have a belligerent nation who's actively involved in a war right now with a weapon uh, no other nation, including China, can defend against. And uh, while China has a weapon very similar to this that they've tested uh, successfully, that doesn't mean that they can defend against it. So right now, there is a huge offensive capability in the hands of a belligerent nation. And there's not much we can do. Uh, what we are doing right now is we are diversifying our, our weapon allocation across the fleet. This has been something in progress for a long time, focused primarily in the Pacific fleet, but it's gonna affect the Navy uh, worldwide, the American Navy. We're building more smaller ships and putting uh, VLS on all of them so that not one ship like the Ticonderoga with over 120 some VLS um, tubes uh, is, a, is an easy target and then you lose all those tubes. Well, if we diversify those hundred some tubes over 10 ships with 10 tubes apiece, no one missile can sink all those offensive capability you know, of the fleet. Where if it hit the Ticonderoga, you would lose all those missiles at once, right? So we're doing that. Uh, another thing is because of the compressed uh, flight time from launch to target, we do have to diversify our firing authority. Uh, this is also known as launch on warning, um, or it can be launch on warning, which means that once you detect this thing coming into your theater, the theater commanders on the ground have carte blanche authority to uh, counter, counter, counter the threat, whether they're a target or not. Now, the problem with this is this can lead to a mistake where a local commander uh, you know, takes action against uh, what he perceives to be a strategic threat with a strategic use of force. And that can lead to you know, a hot war very fast, making, it, making a mistake. Uh, and we don't, the reason why we don't give uh, local commanders on the ground that kind of authority so that that doesn't happen. It's like setting someone up to fail and then being surprised when it, when it happens. So, but right now, because of that compressed decision time, we need to streamline our communications. That's a big thing. And then if we can't get inside that decision-making window, we need to push the authority to launch down lower and lower on the chain of command. And that can lead to a real issue. 
Uh, the last thing is we can always strike first and nobody wants to do that, but this missile can be countered if you destroy it in its silo. Uh, but that would be a military strike on, you know, a military ship, plane, you know, silo. They're, they're going to build a land version of this missile. Yeah. So that right now is our only defense, though, because we don't have a defense to defeat this weapon once it's in the air. And like I said, I'm sure that's being worked on. But as far as public information is available, we don't have a reliable way of defeating this weapon. And that's the biggest thing I want you to take from this weapon is Russia has demonstrated a very long range fire weapon, hypersonic weapon that can, uh, you know, travel a thousand kilometers and hit a ship. And we can't stop it. All right, everybody. Hey, I got a Patreon. You know, if you uh, like what I do here and you want to support us a little bit, uh, please click the link uh, in the description for my Patreon. I'll take you right over to it. I also usually throw a little icon up here on the screen that should take you to it as well. Uh, I do appreciate it. And thank you to the Patreons that support me already. Uh, we're looking to grow that. There is a ton of information on the Patreon that is not on YouTube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think you'll like it over there. Research notes, photos, um, and then of course, sub briefs, we have over 50, probably 60, but I'll say 50 sub briefs now over there. So not even the ones on YouTube, they go to Patreon first. All right. Thanks for supporting me, everybody. Have a great weekend. Bye. I said weekend. I'm still in weekend mode. <laughs> All right. Beer time.